Ah. The walkout rate was pretty low, I have to say. Yeah, really. <laughs> but oh my goodness, what a strange and fascinating <laughs> film. More walkouts. Nice, yeah. <laughs> But yes, but uh, I mean, it's it's already in the in the uh, in, in the end credit uh, sequence that I really only killed one end for this film. So like this, I didn't kill the slug. So they they actually had it pretty nice in my apartment where I built my little horror chamber. <laughs> yeah, this really a very cute story that you have about those slugs. So yeah, the story is that that Florian, the crazy uh, DUP that I worked with, who is also completely obsessed with uh, macro photography and that kind of stuff. So I was uh, kind of like making a schedule with him because I didn't have a lot of money for that uh, film. So the problem was that we kind of had to fit it in his schedule. So and we were guessing that we would start recording end of September 2019. So it's not a COVID film. So we, we shot and, and I wrote the whole thing before COVID even happened. So uh, we wanted to shoot in September, end of September 2019. And then he got a really well-paid job for two months uh, at another production. And so uh, we had to postpone the whole recording until November. But I already had gotten like 12 slugs from friends who were collecting them in their gardens. And... Uh, so what do I do with the stupid slugs? I, like, I had to keep them for two months until we shot the film because I couldn't set them free because in November I wouldn't get new slugs because in, slugs in you know, Europe, it's cold, you know? And uh, so I had the slugs and I thought I just need a bucket and have the slugs in the bucket. And we shoot the scene with the slugs, the first thing, and then I set them free. But then I had to care for them for two months. And I'm really terrified of slugs. Most of the stuff you see in the film are my personal fears, you know, like the earwax and all that stuff is like stuff that I really personally hate. Also slugs, kind of like minor slug phobia, yeah? And then I had to take care of them for two months. I bought a terrarium at Amazon and I fed them salad and strawberries and they had, all had names after two or three days. After two weeks, I had them crawl on my, on my hand and they were all my friends. <laughs> and, and of course, I couldn't kill them uh, or even one. So the story was that uh, I needed something that looks like salt crystals, even in the macro photography. Uh, so what do I do? What can I put on the slug that doesn't kill the slug? So I went to this like chemical supply store in Vienna and I asked them, so, hey, uh, I need something that looks like salt, like salt crystals, but it's not salt crystals. It has a completely, it, it can't like, um, like suck uh, water uh, uh, and stuff like that because that's what, uh, what kills a slug is because a slug is so much water that, it, that the salt extracts the water out of the slug and that's how it, how it gets killed. And, and the person I was talking there, she, she looked at me and said like, this is a really strange and specific question. And like, and why, I, why? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I want to put stuff on a slug, but it can't kill the slug. And then she looked at me and, I know exactly what you need. <laughs> and then she gave me some stuff based on magnesium. I don't know, I, I can't even remember exactly what it was, but she gave me like a dose. It was kind of expensive, like 45 bucks or something like that for a small, bottle and then I put that on the slug and when the slug of course moves around and doesn't like it that's only because I mean if I would go to you and put weird shit on your head you would also move around so that's what the movement of the slug is and in the end when you see the slug kind of like slow down and die that is just a digital effect that just like slowed down the movement of the slug so it doesn't move anymore and then it's it's uh, yeah so no slug got killed no bird got killed not even the mouse got killed. I found the dead mouse in my garden. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so that's the story. But the ants, the ants, a very expensive ant because I wanted real ants that could live in, because I shot it in, in, in Vienna, I still needed uh, proper looking ants that looked like ants that would live in Florida. So I ordered at this like ant store, I ordered the starter kit for a colony for ants. Uh, for Floridian harvester ants. So I got the, the starter kit with five ants and one queen. <laughs> and, uh, and when I really had to crush the one ant, that was the one animal I had to kill in the film, I thought like really, fuck, it's like 30 euros now that I'm crushing. <laughs> because the starter kit was like 120 bucks or something like that. I don't know, it was expensive, yeah. 
I, I, I take the blame and the guilt for killing one ant. That's, that's, that's I do. <laughs> but not the rest. Um, masking Threshold was uh, filmed in your own home mm -hmm. in Austria, yet everything that we see is typically American. What's the story behind that? So yeah, I wanted that it, uh, of, of course, I, I shot it in my home, so I, 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 I just dedicated one apartment for half a year to be the, the, the torture and horror chamber. So it used to be my, my, my pretty much like my, my storage unit in my house, my storage uh, place, and I uh, dragged all this stuff out and kind of like made the, the studio, this like horror room. And uh, of course, I wanted it to, uh, to take place in Florida, and there are different reasons for that. In the beginning, of course, I talk a little bit about the bad healthcare situation in the US, et cetera, et cetera. So there were many, many, many reasons why I wanted it to, to be in Florida. And uh, so what I needed is, I, and because you see all this stuff so detailed, you see the pencils and everything is like so close, that you can't really trick a lot. So what I needed is like, I needed kind of like an everyday American room. So everything in America looks different. Even the, the, uh, the form of the staplers is different, everything. Yeah, the, the form of the plastic bottles of Coke, etc. So what I did is I was in Florida in summer 2019 and uh, I bought two extra suitcases and filled it up with all the stuff that I need for the film. So plastic bottles, vinegar, uh, you know, like whole foods, uh, algae, all, all that stuff. So pretty much like all the stuff you see in the film, uh, I brought home in two suitcases. The only thing I forgot was grass. <laughs> Even the grass you see in the film is Floridian grass because you will see a difference. So a friend of mine was coming uh, in November uh, from Florida to visit me in, in, in Vienna. And I told him, hey, I need grass. Uh, bring me grass. And he's like, what the fuck, what? Yeah, just take like a Tupperware, put grass in it, bring it to Austria. And he was super afraid that the Austrian customs would catch him and like, why are you bringing grass? <laughs> but uh, I, I'm a very nerdy person. The, the character in the film is almost like the dark side of me. <laughs> and uh, so I'm very peculiar about all of ca that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I wanted it to be perfect. And so that's, that's what I try to do. <laughs> uh, there's so much macro photography mm -hmm. in this uh, movie. That must have been quite a challenge. Oh, yeah. So first of all, like uh, most of the stuff is shot with a 65 millimeter lens that uh, by Canon that is not made for like 20 years or something like that. So if you rent that lens, uh, it's roughly 500, 600 euros per day of rental fee. So I, of course, couldn't afford that with a budget of like close to 20,000 euros that I had for that film. And uh, so the good thing was that when I talked to Florian, the camera guy, uh, and we were debating, so what lenses could we use? How can we make this affordable? And he said like, there's a good friend of mine. He has this like super great 65 millimeter lens sitting in his living room for like 20 years now. He never uses it. And uh, he bought it at like a flea market at some company that went bankrupt. So we can ask him. And then we got that macro lens for free for three months from, from that guy. And that's pretty much like most of the stuff we shot with that lens. And it's also very tricky because with that level of magnification, uh, it's like even if you are very calm and you use a tripod and all this stuff, of course you couldn't shoot that stuff without a tripod. But even so, even if there are movements you see in the macro photography, it's just a shaking tripod. Uh, because if you're so close to that stuff, it just like wiggles around. So what we usually did is we hit record and left the room. And then, the, because even if you're there and breathing and moving on the ground, like the whole thing is super shaky. If you're in super, uh, like in, 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 the, in, in the maximum magnification mode of like five or something like that. And uh, that of course was quite tricky with, for example, the slugs, because you have to follow the slugs and, uh, uh, sometimes, yeah, you, you can't really just like hit record and leave the room because you wouldn't know where the slug is going and all that stuff. So that was kind of tricky to, to find. Uh, I learned to, to, to hold my breath for like two minutes or something like that, just to not move the ground, not move anything. So that, that was quite a challenge, yes, I have to say. But uh, it was worth it. <laughs> where does one get the idea for such type of movie you get from anyway? Oh, because it's so different. Well, I mean, it, it, there are films like that where it's about 
a guy or someone going insane, and then there's some form of, of showing that. But, uh, but I, I mean, the basic idea was I wanted to, to make a film that is pretty much showing this like descent into madness of a guy. And I also wanted to make a film about someone kind of like almost like a very rational or hyper-rational being like myself, almost like, so how, how would an evil version of myself with some problem react to all of that? And I, I kind of have to say most of the stuff that the guy says in the film, so his reflections on life and reflections on evolution and all that kind of stuff is pretty much also something that I would probably say if we go and eat Belgian waffles or something like that, we would have like the same conversation. But of course, what comes out of that, so what he does with that information, with that of worldview, uh, I, I crank that up to a thousand into the wrong direction. So it's pretty much a film about a guy who kind of like lives in this like sort of womb in a certain way because he also never leaves the room. And even if you, even if he, if, if it's implied in the film that he left the room when he went goes to his uh, mother to get the boxes with the old like research material and all that stuff, you never go outside of the room. You see that traveling on the cell phone. So even if he does something in the bathroom where he like grows like 165 pounds of algae in the bath in the bathtub, he doesn't take the camera to go to the bathroom next door probably. But you see it on a screen, filmed from a screen. So I really wanted to keep everything in that womb and he can't leave. And it's, for me, my idea was like, it, it should be something about a guy who is not really likable. So I think that the guy is from the beginning an awful mansplainer, you know, like he's, a, he's an awful guy from the beginning, yeah? But I always wanted to create the character that you kind of like him in a certain way. So because he's, he's odd or something, but at some point there comes the point where you just can't like him anymore. And I think that is also different for all the people who sit in the room because, I mean, I can make the, the, I, I can make the, the little game here. So uh, what do you think, when, when was the guy definitely not likable anymore? What was the thing that he did or said where you say, nah, that, this, is, this is not, that, that's, I, I don't understand him anymore. What would that be? Yeah. That's pretty late. Slugs, good, okay. Well, I actually think there's some sort of logic in, in his actions. There, there is a logic in his actions, yeah, yeah. I wasn't shocked by anything he did because there was this sort of <laughs> a very odd logic as we were following his train of thoughts. And like a completely weird, off the rails, positivistic view of the world in a certain way, yes, yes. There's a lot of empathy for the character, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Your point of view, so I was. Right okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, of course, I, I wanted to create a character that, that, that and, and he speaks about that. Like, I mean, he definitely lived a traumatized life. I mean, he was beaten by his dad. He has scars from that everywhere. Like, he, he's, a, he's, he's, a que he's, he's queer, so, so he's, 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 he's gay, and that probably caused... So there, there are many, many things that I put in, his, in, in the character and in his biography that where you can kind of like say, like, I kind of feel for that guy, and now he has this like stupid tinnitus and, and, and da, 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 yeah? but at some point, I mean, you kind of have this like, I'm not going, this is like not what you do in that case. You, you don't sink in your desk and don't talk to anyone anymore or just like complain about a, a, everyone. You just like, there, there, there has to be another way to that. And I mean, for me, the point was that I, when he starts uh, without telling the neighbor that he's experimenting on the neighbor and trying to give her his like awful tinnitus and and uh, and he doesn't even tell her what he wants to accomplish she t and uh, for me that's the point when there is no debate about the, if the guy is good or not he's just like an asshole like you just don't do that you know and then of course it gets more extreme and extreme and extreme uh, and uh, of the poor birds the poor birds <laughs> I think a few more people have an opinion on this. No? Mm -hmm. uh, why, uh, why did you shoot from behind the, the net uh, last shot? Uh, when he's uh, killing inside? From behind? Because I never wanted to show his face in, in totality. Yeah, it's interesting because the way you're, 
you're shooting the whole film makes that you are in the brain of the character. Mm -hmm. And that's the point when you kind of like step out yeah, of the brain. Outside from that shot. So yeah. that, that's why I mean, there, there, are, there are quite a few shots of his, his head from the back, you know, like with the halo and, and you kind of like see like him from behind. Uh, and, but that's the first time you kind of are kind of far away from him. You're kind of like at the end of uh, like, uh, like as, as far away as you can get in that small little, little room. So that, that, I have to say that image was also the first image I had in mind when I started working on the film. I knew from the beginning, it's a guy who kills himself in the end after doing this like horrible experiments on himself and other people and animals and, and uh, uh, shoots himself and, and, uh, and, and silence reappears. So look, I knew that it, it would be like a, tin, a tinnitus of some kind or some kind of hearing impairment that he has and the hearing impairment ends by himself like blowing his brains out and then there's finally silence <laughs> also for the audience. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering about the very last uh, sentence mm -hmm. said by the character uh, the last and final moment is yours, mm -hmm. the agony is your triumph, yeah. because it's coming from a second identity. And it exactly, that's where I got I it from. Yeah. Why? Because I don't really see the connection between, between that uh, really good Italian movie from the 70s and yeah. yours. <laughs> there's, there is no, there's no connection whatsoever okay. between I like... like reason why you, you no, no, there's, there's no, there's no... There, there are a couple of things in the film where I directly quote people or, 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 or take quotes from people and turn them around or stuff. There's a little bit of Werner Herzog in there, but, but changed, and there's a little bit of this and that. There are quite, quite a ton of references in there. But it's not... Uh, in, in that case, I thought... Uh, because, uh, honestly, I've never seen that film. Okay. I only know, uh, I know uh, the quote from the John Bass song, mm -hmm. the yeah. song that... Yeah. And so, like, and that is one of my one of my favorite songs ever. Yeah, so uh, I know what the film is about, about the anarchists and, and all that stuff. But but for me, that line, like the last and final moment is yours, agony is your triumph. I thought that quote is so 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 outstanding without even any context around it that I thought that might be a good last word. It's actually not the last word he says. The last word he says is like, I, uh, I wish it wasn't so loud. And then he kills himself. So it's not really his last word. But, but, uh, but uh, you, you spotted a reference. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why did you choose to locate the movie in the, in the US? Uh, first of all, because of the bad healthcare situation in the US. Uh, that, that you, like, uh, I think the whole plot in Europe wouldn't work anymore. Because in Europe, I think, at least, for example, if I would shoot it in Austria, the healthcare system and how, what kind of treatment he would get, it, it would just not, not work that way. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't leave a person like that alone like that uh, with a somewhat at least grounded social security system or health system, number one. Number two, of course, uh, I'm a personal fan of the craziness and weirdness of Florida. <laughs> so Florida, you're like, I even have the reference in there with Florida man and all that stuff, you know? And I think there is something so strange about this like extremely free, but also conservative and strange place. So, so I think that, that Florida represents the, the, the enormous craziness, but also uh, poetic, state, I think, of, of, of the US nowadays. I think it is like an excellent example of like how crazy and how strange uh, uh, the US can be. And that's why I thought like it might be a good idea to, to put it into Florida. And I also know that place where it takes place quite well because uh, I've been going there quite some time in the last 20 years because my parents have a little, um, kind of like a little apartment pretty close to where I set the film. So I've been there at least, let's say like 10, 15 times in the last 20 years or something like that. So I know the names of the local brands and the local supermarkets and all that stuff. I know the locations, I know where the hackerspace that's referenced really exists and all that stuff. So it's like, I, I took a lot of knowledge from that local, uh, from that community and from that little town uh, and put it into the film because I thought, 
the, the film is very much about obsessiveness and, and, and trying to find out things and being precise. And he's this like hyper skeptical person. I thought like, uh, I, have to, I, I can't just do that, I don't know, in New York because I don't know so much about New York to be so precise about that kind of stuff. So I needed to take a place that, that I have a good feeling about uh, putting someone there, uh, especially a character like this. So that's why I, I picked Florida, yeah. Any other questions or remarks? What about finding the voice? Oh, uh, I had to listen to 200 nerds. <laughs> so my, my, my co-producer, Julianne, she lives in LA, and uh, I could pretty much like do everything in Vienna in my apartment. The only thing that I couldn't do is uh, find the proper voice of a proper uh, American native speaker in Vienna. They are very good, and I, I work with them. They're very good uh, uh, American native speakers uh, who live in, in, in Vienna and are great actors. But I was looking for a very specific voice, and so I, I worked with her, and, uh, uh, and, and she, she became my casting agent. And uh, at some point, after like, like, I gave her the details, and a month later, she sent me this like WeTransfer link with 200 <laughs> WAV files. So, and with five minute monologues from the film. And I listened to all 200 of them, yeah. I think it took me a whole week or something like that, just like listen to all the voices. Because I wanted a voice, it, it, it's a 90 minute monologue of a guy who is not likable. And he's an asshole and he's a man's plane and everything. And I needed a voice where there is at least a chance that people can go through that, 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 that you want to listen to him to a certain degree. There, ha there has to be some, like, some hypnotic quality in, in the voice. So that's why I was listening to these 200 voices and I kicked out 190 after the first listening, you know? And then 10 were left. And then between the 10, it took me like another like week or two to reflect on them. But it was quite fast and quite clear that I would, would hire Ethan, who, who became the voice of the character. So the, the, the corporate reality in the film is myself. I am the person in the film. Uh, because it was just cheaper and easier for me because it was, we never did sound recordings in the film. So all is Foley or, or post-production. So the whole shooting of the film was just me and my cameraman in that small room. And uh, so it was quite easy to separate myself from the voice because you also never really see the face and all that stuff. So I knew that, that, uh, that it should be, of course, it has to be an American um, uh, native voice. And yeah, and it was, uh, uh, I'm very happy with it because most of the voices I listened to were, I'm not sure if it's the real voice or if they were playing that way, but nerdy voices usually are have this like Steve Urkel quality, you know, this like, this like, and, and he has like this like very nerdy voice, I think, but it's also deep and there's something, there's something dark uh, in it and something, oh, let me tell you about how oh, I kill my mother. Like, you know, like, I don't know, there's something, something uh, nice about it. And I'm very happy about that. I'm very happy that, that, that he, he submitted his five-minute wave file to, to, to Julianne, yeah. <laughs> Maybe one last question, yes? How much did the movie cost? 20K, 20,000 20, US. And half of that was uh, donations of friends of mine who were partially like the, the associate producers. So a friend of mine from, from, uh, from Montreal, uh, um, he gave me like 6,000 uh, Canadian dollars for the film because I told him about the story and he said like, do you need money? I'm a programmer, I have so much money. He's like, can you give me like 6,000? Sure. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Really? Yeah. Uh, and so like 10,000 are, are from like donations pretty much. Like in 10,000 I got from the, from the um, kind of like video art department of the city of Vienna. So it's not even a film grant. It's, uh, it's usually this like smaller grants that you get for, for experimental videos and stuff like that. So, and they gave me 10,000 euros and then that's what I needed. And the cool thing is that I just recently sold it to Drafthouse Films. And uh, so I have the same, uh, 
American and English language distribution company now, like the Act of Killing and 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 uh, the Greasy Strangler, <laughs> and uh, and that makes me very happy. And the interesting thing is like that that I sold the movie for more money than I actually got for for making it. So it's uh, I actually made a profit with it, <laughs> which is completely surreal with this kind of film. Nobody makes a profit with such a film. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, that's it. Something else? Another question? I had a, a tinnitus for five, um, for five minutes when I was like 25 or something like that. I really just like, I just suddenly like uh, out of nowhere. And then after five minutes, it just like went away. And that five minutes, uh, uh, I, I, I can't say that that experience made me do the film. I needed something that drives a person crazy but that you can't really see from outside. So it's because it's only in his head. It has to be something that has a quality of like a positivistic quality because there is something like, like, like hearing disorders and you can treat them, treat them, et cetera. But I needed, I, I needed something that, that you can believe or disbelieve, but it's, it's driving him crazy. So that was the main reason uh, why I chose um, uh, tinnitus. Uh, the cool thing is that uh, my, my wonderful uh, sound designer, uh, read up a lot. I, I gave her all the books that, that I bought for the film because I read all those books because when I wrote the, the film together with um, uh, Samantha, uh, I, I wanted to have a good grounded knowledge of tinnitus. So I read most of those uh, uh, this med medical textbooks and I, I gave them also to my, my sound designer and she was also like totally into it and read lots of it and, and had, had thoughts about that. And I only learned that way later, but uh, Tina who did the scoring of the film and the scoring of the film and, and the sound design, of course, they're kind of like they flow into each other, but there is kind of like, oh, there is like the sound design and the Foley level and some of the noises, but there is also the score and the score was that this, um, uh, uh, Tina, uh, she's a great ele electro uh, DJ from, from Vienna and she kind of like watched the film four times and, and improvised with a Korg uh, uh, synthesizer like a, a to it uh, and recorded kind of like four takes of her improvisation with the synthesizer and then we kind of like mixed those uh, uh, improvisations together and she told me that she actually suffers from tinnitus for 20 years or something like that. And when she chose the sounds that she would use uh, with the synthesizer to play the soundtrack, she said like she, she just specifically used kind of like patterns and frequencies that she's hearing all the time or that she's suffering uh, from. And uh, that of course gives it a completely different level if you have like the sound designer suffer from that, what you're talking about, yeah. Well, I think it's time uh, to wrap it up for now. It, it's Thank time, you so much. It's for time to get here. shit faced. I want some good Belgian beer now. <laughs> we can arrange that. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for, for still being here. <laughs>